I've said earlier. <laughs> um, oh, I um, I wrote a WebSocket server called WingSocket. Um, first thing I should probably talk about is oh wait, first thing I should do is start the presentation. <laughs> What's going on? It's not moving. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Shoot. Okay, now it's working. Okay. okay. So, WebSocket. Um, it's not a super um, familiar technology to everyone. So, um, but what's Web WebSocket? Basically, it's just a, a communication protocol between uh, a client. Um, usually a browser client and a server. Um, first thing that probably comes to mind is that um, that role has been fulfilled by HTTP, the hypertext protocol, since basically the early days of the internet. So let's have a look at the differences between WebSockets and HTTP. Essentially, HTTP is a half-duplex protocol. What that means is um, it's a, uh, basically a turn-based way of two parties talking to each other. Client sends a request to a server, server responds, and that's basically how it repeats. And um, the other aspect to half duplex is that you can send directions, um, you, can, you can send messages in both directions, but you can't do so simultaneously. So, you, as you can see, it's basically completely turn based. Um, in the case of WebSockets, it starts off very similarly, um, just like HTTP. Um, First, a request takes place, which the server um, makes a response. Um, differences in HTTP, the request is about some kind of resource, like a, a HTML or an image or a JavaScript file. In the case of WebSocket, that first request is a, is a handshake. Um, basically, ask the server, can we talk through WebSocket? Um, uses a cryptographic key to do so. And if the server is okay with that, it sends back appropriate response, and at that point, the connection becomes uh, full duplex, which means that the client and server no longer have to wait for each other. I can just uh, push messages whenever they, they feel like it, basically. Um, yeah. Um, so. At this, you know, the, the blue lines is where the, um, the request response paradigm goes out of the window and um, all traffic happens unsolicited. So it means that both sides um, usually they register a callback function and they can just, uh, you know, they receive a callback whenever new data arrives. So in a sense, um, at that point, uh, client-server relation is no longer um, um, asymmetrical, but they basically behave as um, equal peers in a sense. Question? Sure. Um, so, with the website, the client has to initiate the connection, but once it is initiated, anyone can initiate message passing type of thing? Yes. Um, client um, initiates connection to one server. So server, if it supports WebSocket, sends the appropriate resource response back, and at that point, I decide can initiate messages whenever they want to, okay. and all of that happens within a single long-lived TCP um, connection. You mentioned at the bottom there's HTTP two. What's the difference between HTTP and HTTP two? Um, basically, the original HTTP is entirely request response. Uh, turn-based communication, but HTTP also has evolved according to you know, the needs of, of the internet. Things are becoming more interactive, 
and so the latest version of HTTP provides lots of the functionality that WebSocket also provides, but not entirely, and I'll get back to that in a bit. So let's, let's see what's next, because I forgot to. Um, yeah. Um, in essence, WebSocket um, provides a means to offer interactivity um, with low overhead and low, and low latency through a single web protocol. Um, to, well, to understand what kind of thing that makes possible, let's first look at some examples. Um, you can, for example, think of chat rooms, um, browser-based games, online trading, collaborative editing of web documents, media, and even full-blown browser terminals. Basically anything which deals with real-time information that one end of the connection wants to send to the other end as soon as possible. Which is quite different from you know, how HTTP used to work in the early days when the browser just opened the website, got all the data needed, and was basically done talking with the server. So, yeah, to, to deal with the demands of interactivity, WebSocket is an ideal solution. Um, technically speaking, the, um, the low overhead aspect of uh, WebSocket is made possible, um, first of all, through long-lived TCP connections. Once uh, the handshake has uh, been completed, the T one TCP connection stays alive for the duration of the entire session between client and server, and all resources needed during that session um, happen through the same connection. Um, long of TCP connections is technically possible through HTTP as well, um, through a, a, a parameter called keep alive. In practice, though, the limitations of that solution is that uh, most server uh, implementations um, uh, use a timeout value, which is on, usually only a few seconds, uh, maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Uh, what that means is that's long enough to um, load all the resources uh, where a website would usually want when opening a website. So, uh, but not long enough to uh, maintain a you know, interactive session for the duration that the user is actually using the website. Another advantage is uh, pipelining. In a turn-based scenario, you have to wait. Um, uh, well, when you send a, uh, make a request, you have to wait for the response to your previous request to have been completed before you can have to, before you make the next request. Pipelining means you can send, send one request and another request, another request, without waiting for your responses to those requests to come back first. Now the same thing is also possible with the new version of HTTP2, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing, that's one difference which has been a limited eliminated with the new version of HTTP. Except one drawback is um, HTTP is backwards compatible, which means um, that when a client and a server talk with each other, they have no guarantee beforehand whether the other side will actually support HTTP, HTTP 2 or fall back to you know, to embrace HTTP version 1. And the final and probably most crucial difference between HTTP as it originally existed and WebSocket is that with WebSocket servers can push events whenever they occur. Normally a um, client would have to ask the server do you have anything new yet and the server would respond no not yet and then it would happen again and again until you know sometimes something happens. Um, now of course this is um, has been a thing for a while, even before WebSockets were invented. So there were solutions for that without WebSockets as well. 
and one of those is long polling. That means um, the client uh, sends a request, and instead of the server immediately returning response for I don't have anything yet, it basically uh, doesn't respond to the request until a response for a resource is ready. Um, which is a lot better than polling all the time, but it still uh, means that once a resource is ready and a response comes back, the client still needs to make another request for another uh, resource. So it still has one round trip overhead. And one more way of providing um, server-side pushing is through a technology called server sent events. Um, which solves the server to client problem um, but it doesn't allow client to server communication so if you want to do full duplex communication with server side events you need another connection for client to server out of bound basically so you still have the overhead of two two connections in that sense and finally um, HTTP 2 um, actually has a feature called um, what's the, what's, I forgot what it's called um, anyway it has a feature <laughs> right? and its feature entails that the server can um, try to predict what resources the client might need um, so it's like predict predictive pushing but the problem with it is it works well when a client loads a, a website because it usually needs the same kind of resource every time so the server can predict what it needs to send back and it can do so for HTTP 2 but on the client side there is no API for the no, application so basically JavaScript code to get an event, get a notification when anything from the browser arrives so for on, the, on the application level it's not very useful so uh, if we're going over all these alternatives, you can see that for low latency interactivity, WebSock is basically the only solution that provides all those aspects in the single protocol. So let's step back for a second and address a question which might already be on your mind. So like, why did I get involved with WebSocket? And Furthermore, why did I bother writing my own WebSocket server implementation? Well, it's not a very convincing story, I'm afraid, but back in 2012, 2011, I was involved with, well, involved, but interested in uh, virtual currencies, Bitcoin and, and others like it. And basically, um, to use virtual currencies, first you need to convert your real money into those virtual currencies. Right? So you use one of those um, websites that function as an exchange uh, between currencies. And I noticed that lots of them were popping up, but technologically speaking, they didn't seem to do a very good job. And like, um, if, if you want to have an effective trading place, you need very low latency and I noticed well it's taking sometimes up to several seconds before transactions were completed and right at the same time the WebSocket standard was uh, published so I was thinking well can I use this WebSocket standard to um, um, create something more effective something more scalable and maybe create an attractive trading place online and now what my idea was to, to do only trading between virtual currencies to avoid all the legal hairiness <laughs> aspects. Yeah. So that was my idea then. And then, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, I was a bit ambitious or uh, a bit too large a scope for me to handle at that time. So, you know, after few months or even less I abandoned the project and basically it was um, a bunch of dead source code um, but technologically speaking I enjoyed writing that code and 
after a while I looked back at all my half-assed projects and it was the most interesting and I saw well it didn't work out but it has you know potential for many other use cases so um, I kept working on it um, over the years just because I had new ideas of how to, Im to implement it so it just became my pet's hobby project but I kept it private because there's sort of like a mental um, mental hurdle to, to publishing stuff online right, on GitHub because especially when you don't have much online yet you want your stuff to be uh, presentable you know? so it's called well documented um, anyway I would, didn't feel ready to do that yet but maybe a year or two years ago I decided well I need to finish this let's just press um, on GitHub just to to have well for two reasons really to in the hope that this project might live on in, in some form and be useful to to whoever um, needs a performance web socket server and basically to 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 link to from my resume just to have a sort of portfolio of sorts of something I can do on on a low level so. That was for me was reason enough to um, decide to yeah really invest time to to make a working software solution and I reached version oh, what I call version one about last last November and and pretty soon afterwards I I found a decent job and I don't know if it's because I created this thing but you know, it might have been useful. Okay, back to WebSocket protocol. Um, I want to, yeah, I've established that it's a, it's a useful um, protocol to have, um, but I found out when trying to implement that it's pretty, pretty tricky in many cases, in, in many aspects. So to demonstrate why it's um, quite complicated to create a good implementation, you have to look at the protocol a bit more. Um, this is the the early uh, handshake phase I talked about earlier, and as you can see, it's basically just HTTP request response. Um, the host. Uh, uh, the only thing that's different from an, an ordinary HTTP request it has an upgrade header WebSocket, which tells a server that it wants to talk through through WebSockets and as proof that the server actually supports the WebSocket protocol it takes a key sent by the clients and performs some 10 minutes left okay <laughs> and performs some cryptographic um, no, steps on it I forgot the details and sends it back as proof that it can actually do so So why HTTP headers? Why not just start a completely different uh, format for the, for the new protocol? And the reason is to provide some degree of compatibility with HTTP in the sense that it makes it easier to run um, WebSocket servers on port 80 and 443. That is uh, um, the, yeah, the standard HTTP ports. Uh, to provide uh, proxies and servers that can do both HTTP and WebSockets and upgrade upgrade the connection where possible uh, has another advantage that it allows um, it allow it it decreases the <coughs> chances of the connection being blocked at the firewall level. Um, yeah, and handling by, by proxies. That's not a very nice sentence, but okay. Um, so. I already said that, didn't I? Okay. So, why is that complicated? Uh, well, yeah, basically it just means the server needs to be able to parse HTTP as well as the actual WebSocket um, syntax itself, which I'll talk about later. So, 
it basically needs to do two things, uh, which um, means you have to um, keep track of state machines on different levels, both HTTP and WebSocket, and uh, buffer at many different levels. Every time a message arrives over the network, you have no idea if it's the end of a message or the start of a new message, and everything can arrive in arbitrary um, chunks of arbitrary lengths. So it makes it um, um, yeah, complicated to keep track of, uh, of where every connection is state-wise. I mean, it would be easy to show a source code, but that would be <laughs> beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, so yeah, another drawback is that you have to maintain both HTTP state and WebSocket, so it's uh, hard, it's easier to um, to leave vulnerabilities in your code just because there's a, a larger surface um, to deal with. So one one solution or you know common sense solution is to to delegate the HTTP parsing aspect to a dedicated HTTP server proxy or just use some other you know, generic HTTP library. Um, what Ringsocket does is not really... <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what I did is basically I, um, I tried to keep the HTTP parsing aspect to a minimum and only deal with those um, HTTP headers you saw earlier that are actually relevant and keep the code as, as small as possible. For one reason, I didn't want to use um, a separate process or a separate library, it's just to keep the ease of deployment, uh, um, reduce the number of dependencies and the number of, uh, um, well, yeah, mostly just to uh, keep control over the whole state machine. Um, once the WebSocket handshake has been completed, um, every message is sent uh, through any number of, uh, of frames. And this is basically a diagram of how a frame looks on the byte level. Um, the first is a, a control byte, which specifies a number of opcodes. And the opcodes determine whether a message is a binary message, an HTTP message. Um, or a control frame that sort of can say I want to close the connection or a ping to ask the other side are you still there, are you still alive um, next is a length byte um, it just basically um, determines the, the length of a, of a payload and there is this um, masking aspect uh, all frames from client to server um, mask there um, uh, payloads with uh, by soaring payload. Um, it does that to prevent uh, um, cache poisoning, basically. Okay. <laughs> um, well let, let's skip that. It's not very crucial. The 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 main point I wanted to make by showing the frames is that any message can be sent over any number of frames. This 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 bit here um, determines whether a, any frame is the final frame of a message or not. So for example if I have a 20 byte message it can be fragmented across 20 frames for example. I mean no reasonable implementation would do such a thing but the standard allows it so you even even fragments of zero bytes are allowed by the standard. So it means you have to handle arbitrary chunks of frames coming in, and that provides a bit of a design issue as well because there's two two ways to look at WebSocket. One is message based. Uh, do I want to? application code to receive full messages or do I want to send a chunk whenever it arrives to the application 
as as a stream basically. Um, if I if I buffer whole messages, then the code is easier for the application. But if you have large messages, then a buffering means I have you know poor latency and you know potentially a lot of uh, a lot of uh, message data that has to be kept in memory. On the other hand, if I use if I send every chunk one by one, it makes it sort of pushes the burden of, of taking care of that to the application, um, and it complicates you know, what kind of API do I define for the application. Um, so yeah, or you could even um, allow both um, one one API for message-based communication and one for streams, but no. That's even more work for WebSocket implementation. Um, what WebSocket, uh, what WingSocket chose is to, what I chose is just to use messages because I consider um, WebSocket's main advantage to offer low latency messaging between many different parties. And then I believe if you're going to send large files, then it usually makes more sense to use a different technology anyway. Another reason that I think message-based and message-based API is preferable is because um, in many cases the server-side backend application can dictate two more minutes that's not much <laughs> um, can dictate what the appropriate sizes are so um, if a, if a backend wants to handle large sizes it is free to um, to to break them up in messages itself okay. uh, if I feel like it if there's demand I can have the stream interface in the future I've written WingSocket in C because uh, my my goal was to be able to handle many simultaneous connections, and all those connections um, have long-lived states, which means you need to hold lots of variables in memory. And C provides a lot of control of how you, um, you know, assign your uh, memory, uh, how you um, have your memory laid out so and so you use my structs and bit packing to keep that compact um, and prevent uh, you know, to um, to improve CPU cache currency and another reason is to um, is is that uh, especially on Linux and uh, in POSIX systems all the um, the functionality the API is for for networking is historically C based anyway so uh, code dealing with sockets, you know, the TCP level stuff is also C. Um, I used EPOL for e event based handling, a few Texas, uh, event FDs, and um, C11 Atomics to you know, handle uh, concurrency. And I, I found it made, yeah, made sense to use C for that just to have complete control over what, yeah. Goes on. Um, and also, uh, a drawback of, of C is that there are not, not many um, standard library functions you can rely on. Oh, it's time. Okay. okay. Let me just show me the, the, um, the visuals a bit and then I'll just uh, end it for today. Um, well, event based. Basically, the main point is you don't want to have more threads running at the same time than necessary because of the context overhead. And I use lockless ring buffers to. I'm going to show you. Um, worker threads. Um, usually, you want to have about the same number of worker threads as you have CPU cores and have uh, long yet threads to prevent a context switching. And I have dedicated threads for uh, backend applications. That's the framework aspect of RingSockets. Um, between every worker thread and every 
app thread, I have um, it's the, uh, yeah, the ring buffers, one ring buffer for inbound uh, messages and another ring buffer for outbound messages, uh, single producer, single consumer. This is, oh, I, this is actually um, a single JSON file which handles all the configuration values um, for ring sockets in a single place. So it make, this makes it quite um, straightforward to to set things up. It's a bit hard to see, but basically this is um, uh, the ports. You can use any number of ports, interfaces. You can, you can set en encrypted or unencrypted based on the port. So if you want to tunnel over TLS or not over TLS, uh, handle um, this takes care of the certif certificates for TLS. So uh, just provide the uh, public key and, and the private key and it takes care of the of that layer as well and this is basically the apps backend apps uh, specified here backend apps are created as uh, shared objects so basically um, dynamically linked uh, runtime libraries and you can specify what back what endpoints uh, urls you want for your apps it's um, quite flexible and those relate back to the values configured here um, finally, I wanted to actually um, give you a small demonstration of um, a uh, RingSocket backend application. Basically, a hello, hello world example, but maybe some other time because mm -hmm. I've run out of time. A final slide is what I want to do next with RingSocket package releases. Um, I have a test suite, but I need to. Um, improve it still actually to create some benchmarks so I can demonstrate why I think this server uh, offers better or at least good conf performance compared to others and I'm quite excited by language bindings because it should prove quite easy to create a C++ Rust um, backend interface you can just plug in your backend apps uh, regardless well uh, of, the, of the language it doesn't need to um, to stick to C uh, paradigms basically and I have one still unreleased um, uh, single sign-on uh, extension uh, for Google in this case only but the others would be nice to what it allows is basically to, to take care of the uh, authentication uh, without having to write that in back end code. Yeah, okay, well that's uh, the ground I intended to cover. But okay. Any questions? Right? Okay, question time right now. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably five minutes for questions. So go ahead. You developed everything yourself? No, no communication with other people about it? No, I mean I should have maybe, but... <laughs> <laughs> you can still do? Yeah. I'm trying to now. Yeah. <laughs> No, because that would be very useful. They have feedback directly from other people. And yeah. Work together yeah. Or well, I mean, um, oh, I have um, I've posted to a message board. Uh, I have this whole thing on, on GitHub, open source, so everyone can see the source code. Uh, and yeah, so text-based mediums I have used to to a small extent, and I'm uh, planning to to promote it a bit more uh, once I have implemented a bit more of these uh, wish list items. What was but the feedback from the people? Oh, that's pretty cool. I, or like, I was looking for that, so it was actually pretty po positive. Yeah. Yeah, do you know if it's used anywhere yet? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, I mean, it's only basically considered usable since November. Right. I mean, it was usable yeah. before, but it wasn't obvious how to use it, so yeah. I mean, I use it myself for a few applications, but but not anything um, I've published or. Yeah. What was your like uh, main target for that? Is it like a Linux desktop or an embedded device, or like with the memory constraints and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. um, well, my original idea is just a generic uh, Linux server, but considering its efficient use of memory, it might be pretty suitable for embedded devices as well. Like a router or something. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, also, these days, Docker is very popular, and I have a Docker uh, Docker file ready, so you can basically implement it all over the place. And uh, if you have interesting results, uh, let me know. Yeah, because maybe my team from Safecast would be interested. Oh, really? You know, developers. Okay, well, yeah. send me a message. <laughs> and can you come back me on your first slide? Uh, your, your contacts, emails. And oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. Do we have that online? Oh, yeah, we, we, okay. we have it online. But just in case. Yeah. Yeah, so, what kind of applications are you using it right now? I mean, what's the like, just mm. give an example. Well, obviously, I abandoned the whole cryptocurrency thing, but I, um, one thing I do is, is quite personal, but I have a. I, um, a manager app, which is not entirely finished, but it basically uh, just a schedule. Uh, it's, a, it's a view, a view web app. And one thing I already find being being so good useful for is that I, if I type here in my web app, mm -hmm. I immediately see it in my uh, cell phone. Mm -hmm. So like the the, um, the collaborative editing aspect is what I implement. And of course, for this use case, I don't need any performance, so this is way overkill. But you know. and one other thing I um, I've also implemented is a um, a, web, uh, a browser-based um, terminal, mm -hmm. just uh, basically SSH uh, through a web browser, which is I mean it still has some rough edges, but it's it's pretty fun. And it would be useful for. We have a lot of I, I, IoT devices and yeah. to communicate that would okay. be great but because of low latency and it's what we need. Yeah, but I think that would need a lot more testing yeah, before. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's definitely encouragement. Yeah. I, can, I, I have resources. Mm -hmm. Is uh, ring circuits uh, appropriate for full duplex video? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Uh, sorry, what kind of video? Uh, full duplex video exchange. Uh, you mean like uh, bidirectional, like? Uh, Chat rooms. Yeah, that yeah, we've, we've yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, that said, I haven't actually implemented the stream-based API uh, yet. Yes, I mentioned right. That's why I was. Uh, so yeah, you should probably work. wait for that. Yeah, right. yeah. Because as as it is, it's um, it's oriented to um, yeah. small messages. If you have application code which breaks the streams right. into into chunks, if it takes care of that, then it would be fine. And with the video, you actually want to drop frames. If they start getting laggy, you mm -hmm. want to drop frames to keep up for the latest right. frame. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good point. So in that case, actually, it might be a good idea for the for the application code to take care of that. Care of that right. And then you can use, on a lower level, the messages that RingSocket provides. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there people doing similar like what you do? Or you develop? You um, know? Probably not really. I mean, the, the, if I take C language, there is a WebSocket implementation, of course, but it's library based. Mm. It, it basically means it's a quite a complicated API. And you just have to call the library every time you want to do something. Like and this is more framework based, um, providing self contained modular back end apps, which doesn't seem to be something that has been made yet, at least not on the low level or C and the like, which is why some people were enthusiastic when I told them about it online. Mm -hmm. really nice. yeah. We'll have to stop here for yeah. question because you have a second presentation. Yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll probably have some time afterwards, after the event you want to talk mm -hmm. about, so yeah. uh, please keep your question for yeah. And I would like to thank Raphael because he helped me this week preparing <laughs> because it's <this is> absolutely <laughs> hopeless for me to... Uh, yeah. Maybe next time make some more graphics. Yeah, time <laughs> consuming though. <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> graphics are nice. Actually, at first I had only like bullet points, and I was like, Ugh. so yeah. it's okay, Mom, and he told me too, so yeah. Right, thank, thank you very much. much.